Hi students, welcome to the Chapter 18 lecture. In this lecture, I'm going to cover an introduction to ecology and the biosphere. In this photo here, you'll see a sage grouse nest under a sagebrush plant. And you may notice that this environment, as far as your eye can see in this field of view, is very uniform looking. And that is true to some extent. Um, the most dominant plant on the landscape is going to be sagebrush, but if you look closer you'll also see grasses and um, several other little flowering plants here that are also important sage grouse food. Um, but overall the sage grouse is very um, dependent on this sort of habitat. It eats sagebrush leaves in the winter, it nests under sagebrush, and um, they will use clearer areas with shorter grasses as breeding grounds or leks. So sage grouse can live their entire lives in a relatively small area of this habitat. Um, basically what I'm going to be covering in this lecture is how organisms are tied to their environment and how abiotic factors can affect species distributions and whether or not uh, certain animals or plants are well suited to that environment. Ecology is the study of the interactions between organisms and their environments. And to expand on that, you can also think of ecology as the study of the interactions between multiple organisms. So different species also interact with one another and those multiple species also interact with their environments. The environment can be divided into two major components. The abiotic component consists of non-living chemical and physical factors. So the soil type, rocks, um, atmospheric um, gases, different concentrations of gases, mineral availability for plants and animals, all of those would be considered chemical or physical factors. And the biotic component includes all of the living organisms in a certain area. So the species of plants that are available, um, in this case the species of plants that are present in an environment is going to determine um, what primary consumers are there, like this um, grasshopper, and in turn the presence of those primary consumers is going to influence which secondary consumers, such as this southern ground hornbill, are able to live there. So an organism's habitat is the specific environment it lives in, and it consists of both abiotic and biotic components. Ecology can be divided into four increasingly comprehensive levels, depending on what questions one asks. So, for example, organismal ecology, population ecology, community ecology, and ecosystem ecology. And I will um, go into a little bit of detail about each one of these levels in the next few slides. Organismal ecology is concerned with the evolutionary adaptations that enable individual organisms to meet the challenges posed by their abiotic environments. A great example of um, questions you might ask about whales would be what about their uh, physiology allows those animals to dive and um, basically hold their breath for extended periods of time. Um, what about the fat content of this um, female whale's milk allows its young to gain weight rapidly and um, undergo migrations? So organismal ecology generally is focused on individual organisms or species. Population ecology is looking at a little bit more of a broad level. It's concerned with populations. Remember that populations are the smallest biological unit that are capable of evolving. They are groups of individuals of the same species living in the same area and thus are capable of interbreeding with one another. 
Population ecology concentrates mainly on factors that affect population density as well as growth. So with this population of Cape buffalo, you might ask um, which predators are influencing this population's or this herd's um, density? How is that predation affecting the growth rate? How are diseases playing into that? All of those would be questions that a population ecologist might ask. Community college ecology is one step further up, and it's concerned with communities, which are assemblages of populations of different species. Community ecology focuses on how interactions between species affect community structure as well as organization. So people that study community ecology might be concerned with predator-prey cycles. Um, they might be considered, um, they might consider issues such as nutrient cycling within a community, uh, mutualistic or parasitic relationships between multiple species, etc. Finally, ecosystem ecology is concerned with entire ecosystems, which include all of the abiotic factors in addition to the community of species in a certain area. It focuses on energy flow and the cycling of chemicals among the various abiotic and biotic factors. So ecosystem ecologists might deal with food web questions. Um, what are the primary producers in this system? How do they produce their energy that provides the, um, the baseline um, level of a trophic pyramid for this ecosystem? Um, where on the planet is this ecosystem? And in turn, how, how much rainfall does this area get? How much solar radiation does this area get? Um, what are the major factors shaping the environment? The biosphere is considered the global ecosystem. So if you were to look at the entire Earth, um, where on Earth is life supported? Um, how deep into the oceans, how far up into the atmosphere can you find li living organisms? And it includes all the terrestrial biomes as well as the marine biomes. So freshwater lakes, um, saltwater lakes, marshes, oceans and seas. The terrestrial biomes would be everything from the Arctic to tropical rainforests. Abiotic factors are incredibly important in shaping the distribution of species that we see today. The distribution of organisms is largely a reflection of these abiotic constraints or limitations that are present on Earth. Different habitat types affect which species are able to live where, and al alternatively, species evolve within these specific environments and are not well suited to life in different habitats. So you can kind of look, on it, look at it from either angle. You're going to say this habitat type um, limits what species are there, but you can also say the species that you find in this particular habitat are there because they evolved to um, take advantage of these certain environments. I'm going to review the major abiotic factors of the biosphere. Energy source is either going to be solar or inorganic chemicals. Most of the areas on Earth are supplied with solar energy. The main ones that are not are those deep sea trenches um, far below where light can penetrate in the oceans, and those um, ecosystems rely on chemicals that are found within those deep sea vents. This map shows the concentration of chlorophyll. Remember, chlorophyll is that plant pigment that is capable of driving photosynthesis. So the green and the dark green represent high concentrations of chlorophyll. The orange and the red represents low concentrations of chlorophyll. So as you can see right around the equator, there's going to be a lot of plant life 
and that's because a lot of solar radiation reaches those areas. So you'll see that the rainforests of Africa and South America fall within the areas where there is a lot of chlorophyll. Temperature is another abiotic factor that affects how organisms are able to survive, thrive, or not be well suited to an environment at all. And I'll go over thermal neutral zones in the next slide, but briefly thermal neutral zones are um, the range of temperatures in which an organism does not have to expend more than its basal metabolic energy in maintaining homeostasis. So for example, if it's really hot out and we're having to sweat a lot and we're uncomfortable, we are going to be expending more energy than if we were in, for example, room temperature, just to maintain homeostasis, to maintain our constant internal temperature. Similarly, if it's really cold out, we're going to be shivering. Muscle contractions are going to um, cause that shivering and that expends energy. So we are also going to be spending more than our basal metabolic rate in energy just to maintain homeostasis. So the thermal neutral zone is that Goldilocks zone. It's the happy zone where you don't have to expend um, excess energy just maintaining your normal physiologically um, normal uh, body temperature. One of the animals that is particularly sensitive to high temperature is the pika. And there are several species of pikas throughout the world. We have two in North America. The one pictured here is the American pika, and then there's also the collared pika. And despite the fact that these little guys kind of look like rodents, they're actually lagomorphs. So they belong to the same order as rabbits and hares, which are not rodents, and they usually inhabit high elevation areas, which are uh, generally cooler alpine areas where they're not exposed to very high temperatures. There are some habitats close to sea level that support pikas. One example is in the Columbia River Gorge between Oregon and Washington. Um, where micro habitats that are in shaded wooded areas close to water, such as close to uh, Multnomah Falls or any of those other big waterfalls in the gorge, are um, basically creating cool climates even though it's low elevation. Those types of micro climates permit pikas to live at those lower elevations, but normally they are found quite high up on mountain slopes. This is a graph that helps to illustrate how thermal neutral zones work. And this particular one shows tropical species here in blue and arctic species in yellow. On the x-axis we have environmental temperature in degrees Celsius. And the bars represent the range of temperatures over which metabolic rate does not change for that particular species. So tropical species, um, because they have evolved in areas with uh, fairly consistent atmospheric conditions, they maintain a constant metabolic rate over a very narrow range of temperatures. Um, it doesn't get super hot in um, tropical rainforests usually, and it doesn't get super cold. So these species have a thermal neutral zone of moderate to high temperature. We have sloths, night monkeys, humans, and marmosets. This is um, one reason why humans are not very well suited to living in the Arctic, for example. We evolved in a tropical climate, and our bodies are most well suited to a range of about, let's see, it's about 26 
to 38 degrees Celsius. During that or throughout that temperature range, we do not have to expend 